All righty, Job chapter 1. Last week we basically just got through uh, verse 1, and uh, we, we've seen in verse 1 we talked about the land of Uz and uh, the, about its location, it's uh, uh, where, the, where it got its name from. Uh, there in Genesis chapter 10, verse 23, located south of the, of the Dead Sea there over uh, between Egypt and the land of the Philistines. And then uh, we're introduced to Job, who's undoubtedly a real person. He's not a, a fictitious, uh, made-up character by someone who is trying to uh, teach us a lesson. But it is a real person that existed. We looked at Ezekiel 14, 20, and James chapter 5, verse 11, for scriptural proof on that. And uh, throw out all the commentators that uh, claim such. Uh, there are differences of opinion as to what his name means. We looked at those. Um, and we, we, we come up with and we agree that most likely his name is connected with persecution. Uh, it's connected with the nation of Israel. And it's a, he's a picture of their, uh, their time when they're going to be going through the Great Tribulation. The Bible says he was perfect and upright in verse 1. It doesn't mean he was sinless. Uh, it just means that he uh, obeyed God, he loved God, he, he was uh, uh, kept short accounts with God. Because we know that all of sin it comes short of the glory of God. And we've seen Ecclesiastes 7.20, Philippians 3.12, and Psalms 37.37. 37. The Bible says here he feared God also. It means he was wise, according to Proverbs 9, chapter 10. And he eschewed evil. It means he turned away from evil. Uh, doesn't mean, again, that he was sinless. But uh, Job, uh, when he's seen something that he knew was contrary to God, he got away from it, and that's what we all should do. So as we get in here, we'll get into verses 2 and 3, and we'll, we'll, read, we'll start with verse 1 again just to back up a little bit. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I read one black preacher said, uh, if, you, if you don't eschew evil, you're going to chew evil. Whatever that means. And there were born unto him, verse 2, seven sons and three daughters. And his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all of the men of the east. Well, as we see here in verse 2, the Bible says here he had seven sons and three daughters. I don't know if this is where they got that movie, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, but uh, that could have been, I reckon. Uh, verse 3, it says his substance, talks about his substance. Now, if you, if you look at the life of Job and what he had, his substance was probably that of equivalent to, in our day, of a Donald Trump or somebody like that that has, or Bill Gates. I mean, they, you know, those folks, they got lots of substance. <laughs> Amen. Uh, they may not have lots of substance in their soul, but they got a lot of substance, uh, uh, monetary and, and um, material-wise. And, and Job, the Bible says here that uh, he had, in uh, and, and Job's day, the great substance, I mean, obviously there were no cars and Cadillacs and things like that. They had, as the one preacher said, Camelacs, amen. Uh, but he had, uh, he was, if you had... And the the amount of cattle and the amount of uh, uh, livestock that Job had uh, compared to Abraham, Abraham had a, a, was in the same boat. Uh, you are a wealthy man uh, because uh, I mean your your cattle and your oxen meant that you had lots of farmland, uh, and uh, you, he probably loaned it out to folks to use. And uh, so Job was a very wealthy man. Uh, the Bible says here that he also had a very great household. This would have included all of his servants and all the folks that, that re required to, to, to take care of, of all of his cattle. So not only did he have you know seven sons and three daughters, but he had uh, a whole lot of folks working for him, no doubt. And his, his, he had a big ranch, the ranch of Uz. And uh, then it also says here that... He was the greatest of all the men of the East, here in verse 3. So Job, obviously, uh, the writer here is, is letting us know that Job is a man of prominent position. He's got a lot of uh, wealth. He's got, and, and according to thirty-one, Job chapter 31, verse 21, turn over there, 
real quickly. Job 31, verse 21. Job had a prominent position. Not only was he a wealthy man, but he had position uh, in the community. Here Job is arguing back with his friends in verse 21. He says, If I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless, when I saw my help in the gate. That reference to being in the gate means that that was where the the leaders of of a community sat. That's where the rulers and the judges, uh, that's a reference to his position. And so Job sat in the gate. Uh, Lot sat in the gate. He was the one uh, who saw the land of Sodom and went down there and, and became a, a uh, famous politician there. Uh, I don't know how much of a politician Job was, uh, but uh, no doubt Job had a uh, high position there in the land of Uz. Looking at uh, what this verse says, this, this, this pretty much voids uh, the possibility that Job is the same Job of Genesis chapter 46. Um, he says he was. The Bible says here that he was the greatest of all the men of the uh, of all the men of the east. Look at uh, Genesis chapter forty six, and and rightly so. I mean, some would. I mean, if you read this and you came across this this name, you might think this was the same guy because there's not a whole lot of folk in the Bible named Job. But uh, verse chapter forty six and verse thirteen. Here, Jacob, uh, we're at the point where Joseph and uh, you know has revealed himself, and he's in the land of Egypt, and his brothers went, came back to their father to to tell them to tell him about it. And uh, the Bible here is a, is recounting the sons and the grandsons of Jacob. All right, and here in verse thirteen, the Bible says, "And the sons of Issachar, Tola." Puva and Job and Shimron. All right, and so naturally one would think, well, there's Job. I mean, Job was a, a son of Issachar. Well, most likely not, because Issachar, obviously, this is after this, they go into the land of Egypt, and that's where they're at for a lot of years, over 400 years, and uh, because they eventually go into captivity there for 400 years. So it's over 400 years that Issachar uh, and his uh, his sons which includes one named Job, is in the land of Egypt. Job didn't get out, this Job in Genesis 46, didn't get out of Egypt and become one of the greatest men of the East. All right, so that's not the same man. Um, also, it's unlikely that Job of uh, here of Genesis 46, 13 is the son of Issachar in light of Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 18. Turn over to Numbers chapter 20. So we know there are at least two men named Job in the Bible. Job chapter 20, verse 18. How many know a person named Job besides, no, I didn't think so. There's not a whole lot. Job chapter 20, verse 18. The Bible says here, And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will uh, go by the highway, and if I uh, and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I, don't, I will only, will, uh, without doing any else, uh, anything else, go through the, on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. And so here's a, an account of the children of Edom with Israel as, they're, as after they've come out of Egypt. Uh, Obviously, Edom didn't like Israel. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this Job of Genesis chapter 46, verse 13, being a son of Issachar, uh, obviously didn't make it to the Exodus. He had to have died before then. Uh, and then, obviously, according to Numbers chapter 20, verse uh, 18, uh, Issachar wouldn't have been welcomed and been become one of the greatest men in the land of Edom with this uh, relationship that they had. So Job is a Gentile. All right. The Job that we're studying is a Gentile. He is not a Jew. He is a Gentile that existed prior to Abraham. All right. And so, or in the 
somewhere around there. Um, Job probably held this title as one of the greatest men of the East until Solomon came on the scene. Until Solomon came on the scene. Look at um, 1 Kings chapter 40. 1 Kings chapter 40. Remember when uh, Christ was on, on the earth, he, he was talking to uh, the children of Israel over there, and he said, a greater than Solomon is here. He didn't say a greater than Job was here. First Kings chapter 4, he said a greater than Solomon. And so Job had this title as uh, the greatest men of all the East until Solomon came on the scene. But uh, that's pretty, pretty good company, I'd say. First Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 30. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country, of all the children of the east country, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the uh, Ezraite, and Heman, and uh, I knew Heman would exist. I used to love that. Never mind, sorry. Um, and Cake, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all nations round about. And so. Job held the title as the greatest of all the East until Solomon existed. Solomon came on the scene and he knocked Job off the, off the top. When God labels you as great, when God labels you as great, you're in a class, <laughs> amen, that uh, hasn't had many inductees. Uh, look at 2 Samuel chapter 19. 2 Samuel chapter 19. Uh, God doesn't throw this term when he's speaking about man. He doesn't throw this around lightly. 2 Samuel chapter 19. Look at verse 31. And Barzillai, the Gileadite, came down from uh, Rogalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Now Bar Barzillai was a very aged man, even fourscore years old, and he had provided the king of sustenance while he lay at uh, Mahanian, for he was a very great man. All right, and so this Barz, Barzillai, however you say his name, uh, was a very great man. Look also at Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 8. Here is uh, the prophet Elisha, and he meets this woman of Shunem. And this is what the Lord says about her in verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. So this woman of Shunem, the Bible, the Lord calls a great woman. Uh, we're talking about the greatness of Job, comparing him to the, some of the other great folks in the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Here, the Lord talking about John the Baptist. Again, there's not many people in Scripture where, the, where God makes the mention that they were great. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, the Bible says, Hear Christ speaking, Verily I say unto you, speaking of John the Baptist, Among them that are born of women... There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so Job had the title. Then uh, Solomon got it and John knocked him off. Amen. So uh, Job, but, but going back to Job chapter 1, God did call him great. said he was the greatest of all the men of the east. Now that is talking about not only his substance, uh, but his character, as we will see shortly. Uh, houses everyone his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Before we get on to verse 4, I, I want to back up and say one of the points I was trying to make and I forgot to make it was that because, it, listen, with all the things that are going on, uh, as you see on TV with the Occupy Wall Street crowd and, and people that are upset about uh, the banks uh, and, the, and the, the big corporations and what they've done to us, uh, 
don't think that every person that's, that's got money is evil. Uh, somebody that's, you know, made it good in this country. Uh, Job was the richest man of his time. And and he's the one that God focused on. All right? Now, we know we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that their uh, money, when money causes a lot of heartache. When certain people get money, they're evil, all right? And they, and they do bad things, and they, they step on people, and they, but, but that don't discount the ones that, uh, I forget his name, uh, I meant to uh, look him up, but uh, the, man, uh, the man that rent, run, owns uh, that restaurant chain, the chicken chain, uh, I mean, the, the man, you know, he, he's no doubt got a lot of money now. And and he's he's a very godly man from what I understand, and and, and helps uh, God's people out, and he closes out his business on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, praise God for somebody that's uh, got money, that's got some character, and that's what Job had. All right, Job had he was the, he was the wealthiest man of his day, and God didn't uh, you know uh, send a bunch of people to protest him outside with you know long hair and haven't taken a shower in a while. God, God, if you're if you can if you can have money. And still love God and still serve God, praise the Lord. Go for it. <laughs> Amen. Help yourself and then help somebody else. I mean, you know. But uh, do do right with it. But but those of us that don't have it, <laughs> that haven't attained to it, let's not, uh, you know, just kick somebody down because they're rich. Let's look at the, what they do with it and how they handle it. Uh, and so if you've uh, got a tent down there somewhere in Detroit, somewhere on a, in a park, I suggest you pull up stake, amen? Back to Job chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says here, And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. The Bible says here they feasted every one his day, his sons and his daughters. It's possible here that this is a reference to some sort of birthday celebration. Uh, just as Gentiles today love birthday parties. Uh, Gentiles in the in the uh, the Oriental race uh, also had it was a common happening in their day to have uh, birthday festivities. Uh, so this wasn't a daily party. I mean, it wasn't like uh, you know they each picked a day in the week that they have that they each had a party at their house. Uh, knowing Job's character and how Job raised his children and what he did, I highly doubt he would approve of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's great to have a you know a party every once in a while. We have try to have a fellowship and fun night here every once in a blue moon and every I think once a month or something. And it's fine to do that, but man, life is not about partying. I know we thought like that when we were kids. You know, we thought, man, we're just gonna you know eat, drink, and be merry. You know, and but the, that, you know, once you grow up, you got to put away childish things and then start, you know, living uh, and taking care of things down here in planet Earth. Uh, so life is in a big party, and that's not what these guys were doing. I guarantee you, uh, knowing Job. And so he says, also says here that they called their three sisters. So I highly doubt that Job's sons were involved in a, you know, riotous, uh, you know, party where in their houses and invited their sisters. If you're going to have a party like that, I guarantee you, you're not going to invite your, your sisters. <laughs> All right? So this wasn't the, the, the kind of riotous, uh, lascivious uh, bash that you see on TV and you see uh, maybe in uh, some of your friends. Uh, this was a, a family gathering, all right, with Job's uh, children and their sisters, uh, his sons and their sisters and, and their families. Uh, it was a wholesome family gathering. Verse 5 says in Job chapter 1, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. All right, and and some I've heard it talked about, well, the reason Job had to do this is because they were partying. That's not what he said. He said it may be that they cursed God in their hearts. Not that they were, you know, uh, drinking and carousing the night before. Uh, They were, even though Job's sons here, the Bible says here in verse 5 that he sanctified them. This is after they, this is not just when they were little children. 
when they're, when, when they're kids, it's, it's easy for us to keep them away from the world. Not, well, I shouldn't say easy. It's, it, I mean, that's our job, uh, to keep our children separated, separated from the world. All right? I mean, uh, that's why we, we don't allow them to watch certain things. We keep, uh, you know, uh, certain, keep them from uh, hanging around with certain people. That's our job as parents, just as Job's was, to sanctify, which means to keep up, set apart his children. Uh, and so, parents, it's, it's, it's not the school's job to raise our children. It's not the government's job. It doesn't take a village, all right? It takes a, it takes a family with the Word of God is what it takes. Uh, and, 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 and it's our job to keep our children separated, but Job's children here are adults. They got their own houses. And Job is still being the, the, the father, preaching to them and telling them they need to keep their lives separate from the world. The, pa- the world was pagan at Job's time. I mean, it was the, God hadn't called out the Jews yet, as of yet, most likely. And so the, as we've seen in Genesis chapter uh, 9, after the flood, God had to destroy it with the flood, and then Nimrod comes on the scene, and they all get together, and they form the United Nations, and, and here we go with we are the world, and everybody's just you know happy and partying and, and, and uh, serving other gods besides the God of heaven. And Job had to keep his family separate from the world. He sanctified them, the Bible says here in verse 5. And it says that he offered burnt offerings. So even though these, these gatherings, these family gatherings that his children were having weren't, uh, they were righteous, they were most likely just wholesome family get-togethers, uh, Job didn't take for granted <laughs> that uh, his kids had been mindful to sanctify themselves unto the Lord. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I mean, when we have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights and uh, it's the older folks are still praying for their kids. I mean, they're, they're, out, they're grown up, they're out of the house, and they're living their own lives. But we still hold our children up in prayer. Second Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse, um, verse 19. Paul is telling Timothy uh, how to preach to others, make sure that others know what separation is. He says in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. All right? So the Lord knows us. We're his. We're sealed to the day of redemption. Uh, We're, you know, perfect in the sight of God. We're, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. But what, look what Paul says. With that being said, even though we are sealed and, and, and sin can't have dominion over us, we, we're no longer going to be punished for our sin in eternity in the lake of fire. Thank God. Praise the Lord for that. The blood of Christ took care of all of our sins, past, present, and future. But <laughs> Paul goes on to say, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, what? Depart. From iniquity. Job chapter 1, we just read, said, eschew it. It means shoo, <laughs> you know, tell it to get away, as they, uh, as they said about the fly, you know, shoo fly, don't bother me. He says in verse 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Paul is referring to the house of God. And he's talking about saved people. And he's making a a difference, a a separation between uh, the the Christian standing, who they are in Christ, which is 100% perfect, sinless. That's who you are in Christ. That's your standing in Christ. But he's making a distinction here between how we live our lives down here on planet Earth. And it's very important. There's a lot of Christians today that are trying to downplay the importance of your uh, performance in the flesh and your life in the flesh. And Paul never did that. He says in verse 21, If any man therefore purge himself from these. What's that? What do you mean, Paul? There's a Christian that's got to put some things out of his life. He shall be a vessel unto honor. And there's the word again, sanctified. Set apart. Separated from the world. 
sanctified and meet for the what? Master's use. That's why he left us down here, Maniac of Gadara. That's why he left us here to do a job so we could be fit for the master's use. That's why he wants us to stay away from uh, lasciviousness and sin and, and, and unruly, being unruly. He says, and prepared unto every what? Good work. Some folks, especially in this day in America, don't like to work. And it's even so in a Christian's life when it comes to the work of God. Verse 2, he says, flee also youthful lusts. You know, it's funny. It, well, it's not really funny. It's really kind of insane when uh, you see some of these older folks that... How can I be so kind? That are trying to live out their teenage years. And they reverted to the dress that they used to wear in the teenage years. They reverted to the, the, the hairstyles that they've tried to, that they've tried to, uh, that the kids are having these days. And they're, you know, they, some people call it the midlife crisis. It's a crisis, all right. You need, to, you need to put away childish things. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I did as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Uh, and, and it just, just amazes me to see um, see what goes on in our society with with people. Uh, you know, the, they they get these injections in their face. <laughs> I mean, they try, brother Barefoot. They they try to do away with the wrinkles, and so they get this stuff injected into their face that makes them look like a, a an absolute clown. And they walk around and, and they think, man, don't I look great? No, you don't look great. You look like a moron. Put away childish things and it's okay. Life is about growing older. Be more mature. Help somebody that's younger to get out of their childish stage. That's what we're called to do, amen, as we get older. Paul says here, flee also, verse 22, youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, Peace with them that call on the Lord. That means you're going to have to find some friends that call on the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Once you get saved, you, you know, uh, we're not saying that you just, you know, take to call all your friends and tell them never to come around anymore. You ought to witness to them. But when they do come around, your witness ought to be such that they, they either are nervous and they never come around again, which would be unfortunate for them. Or they, they see something in you that makes them want to serve God or makes them want to get saved. That, that's, that's how we should affect our friends. And so uh, God has ordained it, ordained the church for people of like faith to gather together. He says, uh, With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife and so on and so forth. So here Job is doing what Paul did with Timothy. He went to his children and he said, you know, listen, kids, I, you guys are, are good kids. Uh, you're, you know, you've, you've done me good all these years. He said, but uh, continue to be steadfast, as Paul told us, unmovable. What's that mean? It means don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine or every fad that comes across uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the scene. You know, don't, don't try to be like the world so much that your, your, your apparel has to change every six months because of the new styles that come out. Uh, and we waste money and, and so on and so forth. But Job sanctified his children, set them apart. He didn't take for granted that they were just going to do it. He went to them. And then also, not only did he do that, the Bible says he offered burnt offerings. Listen, you don't have to be involved and revelry and, uh, and you know, uh, lasciviousness and, and, and sin, you know, gross outward sins to be out of the will of God. Job wasn't concerned that his children were partying and, and, and having a good time in the world. He said that he, it may be that they have cursed God where? In their hearts. 
I wonder how many times we curse God in our hearts. Uh, you know, we walk around and we, you know, sometimes uh, uh, piously say, you know, and give God the glory, but inside we're, there's something in us that uh, detests the fact that He hasn't allowed us to have such and such, or He hasn't done this or that for me, or He allowed this to happen to me. And Job was concerned that his children, while might have been living right on the outside, something was wrong with their heart. And eventually, when something goes wrong in the heart, it'll come out on the outside. So Job was trying to cut it off at the pass, and at this time, offered burnt offerings. That's what they did. Notice that uh, the burnt offerings were in effect long before Abraham and Moses. All right, uh, you know, God didn't just give the children of Israel the, 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 the means to, to sacrifice animals and to burn them as an offering to him. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. So this is not just a Jewish uh, situation. Here in Genesis chapter 4, why? Look at verse 4. Abel also brought of the first things of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But Cain unto, and but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth. Why? What happened? Cain was trying to offer, uh, you know, the fruit of his hands instead of the fruit of God's hands and the creation of God and what God had required. God, when Adam and Eve fell, God didn't take, you know, they're the ones who sowed the fig leaves, made themselves aprons, you know, self righteousness, uh, you know, trying to uh, make your own set of rules. So they made themselves aprons. God said, that's not good enough. <laughs> you know, a bikini and a you know, uh, pair of Bermuda shorts ain't going to cut it. <laughs> You're going to have to have a covering. And so he killed an animal. He, an animal died because Adam and Eve had sinned. And it was obviously a picture of Jesus Christ and our Savior and his sacrifice. But notice that Abel continued what God had started. Abel said, well, if it took an animal to cover my parents' sins, then I'm going to offer this animal, and no doubt that's how they made clothes afterwards going forward, but he continued the sacrifice. He continued the offering to God. All right? And, and God accepted it. You know, if, if, if God would have said, hey, well, listen, that's not necessary, he wouldn't have put that in there, that God accepted, had respect unto his offering. It was necessary. God required it. Look at Genesis chapter 8. Verse 20, And Noah built an altar, this is after they come off the boat, unto the Lord and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing that I have done. And so Noah, as a Gentile, before God called Abraham out and before God gave the law to Moses, Abel, as a Gentile, offered burnt offerings to God. Noah, as a Gentile, offered burnt offerings to God. And here Job is doing the same. And so the burnt offering is not just a Jewish ritual. Job chapter 1 again, verse 5. It says, it may be, Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to note that Job had a realistic view of his children. You know, especially in, in churches, you go and, and you, uh, you talk to parents and you'd think that their kids never did anything wrong. Their kids were sinless. You know, it's, you know junior and, and junior are fighting in the back and next thing you know, you know, well, what could have been my son? What did your son do? Listen, man, kids are kids. They're, they're sinners. <laughs> We're all, all of sin to come short of the glory of God, even your kids. Uh, children, and Job, he, he just took for granted that they might have sinned. He says, and it cursed God in their hearts. Uh, I read 
Spurgeon in the devotional morning and evening. And uh, he referenced this verse and he says in that devotional under that day, or that particular day, I think it was at Christmas. What the patriarch did early in the morning after the family festivities, it will be well for the believer to do for himself ere he rests tonight. Amid the cheerfulness of household gatherings, it is easy to slide into sinful levities. So Spurgeon's talking about even in the, our wholesome family get-togethers, all right? Now, he's not talking about party house, all right? He's talking about in our, even in our family gatherings, it's easy to slide into sinful levities and to forget our avowed character as Christians. It ought not to be so. But so it is that our days of feasting are very seldom days of sanctified enjoyment but too frequently degenerate into unhallowed mirth. There is a way of joy as pure and sanctifying as though one bathed in the rivers of Eden. Holy gratitude should be quite as purifying as an element as grief. Alas, for our poor hearts, that facts, uh, that facts prove that the house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. Come, believer, he says, and what have you sinned today? Have you been forgetful of your high calling? Now, when we think of sin, we're thinking of, okay, you know, did I watch this? Did I, did I talk like this? Did I, you know, how was I? And, oh, this, folks, we got a long ways to go. He says, and what hast thou sinned today? Have you been forgetful of your high calling? That's a sin. Have you ever been, uh, have you been even as others in idle words and loose speeches? He says, then confess the sin. And fly to the sacrifice. The sacrifice sanctifies. The precious blood of the lamb slain removes the guilt. And purges away the defilement of our sins of ignorance and carelessness. You say, wait a minute, but I've been saved and, and, and the blood of Christ has already purged away my sins. It, exactly. But what Spurgeon is saying is when that old nature takes over. And we forget those things that uh, we've been called to do, and we and we lapse back in and let the old man run our life. Then what we've done is we've allowed the old man to take over, and the old man obviously is not sinless. He's obviously still has sin on him, and so that's why Paul told us to judge ourselves. If we if it was just the fact that God looked at us and seen His Son, thank God for that truth. That is a truth. We don't throw that truth out, but we don't throw the truth out that we have to confess our sins and judge ourselves of what we've allowed to be done in our body. Because the truth of the matter is that new man, the, the only way the, that God has given us the means to have victory is for the new man to make a decision and, and a, a mindful decision to put off the old man. He's not going to do it for us. And when we don't do that, we allow sin in our lives. And that's why Paul said, judge yourselves. Because those that don't are going to be chastened of the Lord. Why? So you can stay saved? No. So you can not be condemned with the world. If God never chastened his children, Satan would have all kinds of arguments against him. But God chastens his children when we don't confess our sins. And when we don't judge those things that we do that are contrary to the work of God and contrary to the Holy Spirit of God. And the Bible says, thus did Job continually. He never stopped. Uh, we, could, we would do good to learn from Job. I mean, Job is the, one of the oldest books, in the, is the oldest book written in the Bible. And he was long while, and here God put, now there was a day. Now we're getting into the heat of the matter here, I guess you could call it. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. All right, here we have an encounter with this group called the sons of God. All right, yeah, so, so there was a day, Job, the writer of Job, Elihu, is uh, recounting, he's seeing... You know, God obviously had to tell him this, <laughs> what happened, because Elihu wasn't there. Uh, but what Elihu didn't see and what God didn't tell Elihu about was the godly line of Seth come walking before God. And that's what uh, some of the commentators think that the sons of God are. You know, the godly people that came from uh, Seth's line. 
and instead of Cain's line. That's hogwash. The sons of God are what? Angels. The sons of God here, most of the commentators agree that these, you know, in this case, that agree that the sons of God are not the godly line of Seth. There's a lot of commentate. I'm surprisingly, I was shocked. I, I figured I'd go into these commentaries and they would be trying to somehow finagle these these words to, to uh, let us know that these were human beings. Uh, but some of them agree that these are not the godly line of Seth, as Schofield claims that the sons of God are in Genesis chapter 6. But just as in Genesis chapter 6 and Job chapter 38 verse 7, these sons of God are angelic beings. They are the host of heaven. Or it may be that they are, it may be that they are the angels that didn't fall and stayed with God. Look at Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, look at verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of heaven which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. All right, so the angelic beings, just as in this case, stand before God. Here they present themselves before the Lord, the Bible says. It could be that they're angelic, uh, you know, the, the good angels that are reporting back to God for some purpose that they were sent forth to do, sent to earth to do. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. God uses his angels to accomplish certain things, as we know from uh, looking at uh, throughout the Scripture. Here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, Are they not all ministering spirits? That means they got jobs. They, get, they do things. They minister. Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. All right, look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're talking about the sons of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Here's Gabriel. We all familiar with this story just coming out of the Christmas season. And the angel uh, answered, saying unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the what? The presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And so it could be that this scene that we're seeing here where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, that they're just reporting back on what God has given them to do. All right? It may also be that these are the angels which kept not their first estate, according to Jude uh, verse 6, and must present themselves before God to give account of what evil they have done. Like Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and, and had those offspring of uh, mutants and mighty men and, uh, you know, what's that? Uh, the X people or whatever. So it could, be that, it could be that they're good angels. It could be that they're fallen angels. And the fallen angels have to report, just like kind of maybe like a parole officer or something. I don't know. But, it, uh, but nonetheless, here in Job chapter 1, when these sons of God present them themselves before the Lord, the Bible says that Satan came also among them. And get the picture. All right? God's on the throne in heaven. And here, the sons of God, whether they're good or bad angels, we're not quite certain. Could be either or. Here comes Satan. Uh, I read one commentator <clears throat> said, there's no way that this could be real. Because Satan could not have access to, to heaven. Listen, the Bible says that Satan was there. And the Bible, what, when, when, we, uh, when we read the Bible, we take it as literal unless the Bible tells us that it's not literal. So Satan was there, all right? God, obviously, the Almighty God, the one that has rule over heaven and earth, gave him the authority to approach him. Gave him, not the authority, but the permission and so Satan came also among them. So Satan still has access to heaven and to the throne of God. And this access can only be under the authority of Almighty God. And I guarantee you, Satan, when he does come up there, has to be on his best behavior. He's not coming up there and, you know, 
like some, you know, cocky, you know, biker in a bar just barging in and saying, I'm here to take over. No, no, he comes, I guarantee, and he's real humble. He was humbled back there before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. When he said, I'm going to ascend above the stars of God. I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. And God said, oh, no, you ain't. And kicked him out. And that, I mean, God just had to think it. And it was done. So Satan really doesn't have, he's not, he's not just, you know, barging into heaven and saying, listen, God, that's not the way it works. When Satan, what Satan does before the throne is what gave him the title of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Look, look over there. Well, you know what? Let's stop there because there's, we're going to get into a whole lot here. So we'll pick it up next week. We'll talk about Satan's dealings here in Job chapter 1.